Hey, so uh, let's get started with accounts and authentication. So, uh, you know, web applications need accounts, right? If you use Facebook, you need to log in. If you use the final version of Catbook, uh, you need to log in. And in order to have accounts, you need to have secure authentication. Just so you know, we're all on the same page, uh, what we're talking about is how to add these login buttons to your website. You know how you can log in to Google or just log in with the username and password. Uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, as a general overview, uh, we're gonna start off with a bit more on the theory side. And then uh, depending on how much time we have, we might briefly go through uh, the authentication code in Catbook React and uh, the starter skeleton. Uh, but really before we can get into you know, secure authentication, uh, we should really define what we mean by authentication and secure. Uh, so authentication is simply the act of proving your identity uh, to another person. Uh, and there's actually a really large number of ways that you can do authentication. I mean, on the web, the most common way to do so is through just a password. Uh, but you can also use certificates, like the MIT certificate you might have on your computer. Uh, you can use ID cards to authenticate yourself and let yourself into physical buildings. Uh, you also have Duo Mobile, uh, which is a form of two-factor authentication. Uh, some of you might have laptops with a fingerprint scanner. That's another form of authentication. And there are a bunch of others. And all of these, uh, you know, you're proving that you should have access to whatever service you want to, whether it be a building or your own laptop. And again, today, we're just going to be focusing on username slash password authentication today. The other side to this is what exactly do we mean by secure, right? So for our purposes, what we mean by secure is that the server is not allowed to trust the client. And you know, this just raises the next question, right? What do we mean by trust? Uh, and to demonstrate this, we're gonna give a bit of a motivating example. Uh, so let's consider the forming, uh, following form of authentication. It's very simple. The client is just gonna tell the server, hey, I'm Bob. And the server's gonna be like, okay. Now, clearly this would be very, very problematic, right? Because if we had a hacker, uh, they could just pretend to be Bob very easily, right? And so this motivates like the first part, and that's the server cannot trust the client to give the correct inputs when uh, during an API call. Uh, it can't trust it to be correct. But we can actually take this uh, example a bit further. So at the top, we have the normal client. And what's actually possible is that the hacker can write their own version of your client. They can write their own version of your website, or at least the front end. And you know it almost looks the same, right? It's just slightly different. But this is a hacker client. And it can try to trick your server by using your own APIs to try to log in as other users and do you know, strange and weird things. It wants to learn things about your website that it shouldn't have access to. So in general, the server should assume that the hacker actually wrote the client. This is sort of the mindset we want to have when we're talking about secure authentication. Uh, and this isn't gonna be immediately applicable maybe, uh, but towards the end, uh, we'll see where this comes into play. So just a brief outline on the three sort of topics we're gonna to do at first. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about persistence. Uh, then we're gonna talk about how to actually do password storage. And then finally, we're gonna talk about external authentication. You know, whenever you see like a login with Google or login with Facebook, and that is an example of external authentication. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, first thing, uh, authentication needs to persist, right? So imagine you were using Facebook, right? And each time you did an action, each time you tried to like a comment, each time you replied, each time you looked at someone's profile, each time you uploaded a photo, Imagine if every single time you did that, you have to log in, give your username and password. 
That would be really, really, really annoying. And what we want to do is create a way for people to log in once and have it persist. Even if that means if they refresh the page, if they close the tab, maybe even if they close the browser and open it back up again, uh, we want their authentication to persist. And there's really two sort of ways to go about this. Um, the first is through sessions. And the second way is through something called tokens. So we're going to get started off by talking about sessions. And session authentication is done in sort of four main steps. Uh, in the first step, we're going to user is going to submit a login API request. This is pretty, imagine it's what you think it is, right? They're going to submit their username and their password, and it's going to go to the server. What the server is going to do is they're going to, first, they're going to check if the username and password are correct, right? And if they're correct, they're going to look up the user's information. And what they're going to do is they're going to store this login into something called a session. A session is a mapping between session IDs and the user's information. And you can think of this as like a giant dictionary. And the key are going to be the session IDs. And the values are going to be the user information. And when a user logs in, the server is going to create a new session for that user. It's going to get a new session ID. It's going to look up the user information and store it in the session. Finally, the response for this login request is going to be the session ID. And it's only going to be the session ID. There's going to be no user information included. Finally, the last step for the client is to save this session ID in a cookie. Now, if you've used the web at all, you've probably seen those um, banners. Uh, please accept our cookies, yada, yada, yada. Um, these are the same types of cookies, except less malicious, because we actually need them for our website to work. What a cookie does is it allows information to persist, even through a refresh. And this is sort of what we were talking about earlier. So even if the user were to close their tab, uh, close their browser, or reload the web page, the data stored in a cookie is going to stay. Now we can actually use the cookie in future requests. So when you send the request, a bunch of cookies are going to be sent with the request automatically. Now the server can look at these cookies. They can find the session ID. And uh, they can look up the user information. Once they have the user information, they can respond to the user request. So for example, if they're trying to look up like a profile picture of your own uh, account, once they have the user information, like the username, they can go ahead and look up their profile picture. And finally, the server is allowed to respond to the API request. So it happens in four steps. And again, the key thing to note is that the session information is stored on the server. Uh, what do we mean by session information? We mean the mapping between session IDs and the user information. Now, the key thing we want to ask when we're thinking about security is, is it secure? Does this make sense? So my question to you guys is, what happens if someone tries to send the wrong session ID? What happens if a hacker man sends an incorrect session ID? Can they do anything wrong? Uh, any takers? OK, uh, so we'll walk through this. Uh, so there's really two cases, right? If a hacker man gives the wrong session ID, there's two cases. The session ID could exist, right? If it doesn't exist, then the hacker is going to fail because of the, they give like session ID 17 and there's no mapping between 17 and user information. Uh, there's nothing that the server will know that something weird is happening and the hacker is going to fail, right? Now, it is possible for the hacker to somehow accidentally guess the session ID correctly, right? They might get it right per chance. And we can actually prevent this case from happening. So what the server does is whenever it assigns a new session ID, it's going to pick a random session ID, and it's going to make it really, really long. Think like 1,000 digits, 2,000 digits. If it's that long, the hacker cannot possibly guess the session ID properly. And then they will not be able to log into someone else. 
Uh, the next thing we can do is the other sort of way to persist data and log it is through tokens. So the first step is going to be the same. The user is going to submit a login form. And instead of starting a session, the user, the server is just going to send the user information over in something called a JSON web token. And this is just going to have information about the user. For example, it could have like a username and a user ID. And again, the browser is going to put this JWT, this JSON web token, into local storage. Uh, local storage it turns on this uh, number of ways you can persist data. Uh, cookies are one example of local storage, but there's a bunch of others. And finally, uh, in future API requests, this entire JWT is going to be sent along with the API request. Uh, and the key thing to note is that this JWT header is going to be signed uh, in step two. Uh, I'll explain that in a bit. Now, when the server you know, receives the API request, they can look at the JWT and they'll know that the user, who the user is, and then they can respond to the API request. So again, we have to ask, so is it secure? What happens if the user just changes this token? Uh, so in this example, um, the user has actually changed the value of this token that they're sending, and they're trying to log in as someone else. Uh, so it turns out that this is actually not going to be possible because the token is going to be signed. Uh, and this is a fancy piece of cryptography. Uh, it's sort of like encryption, but, but not really. And the essence of this is if the user modifies the token, the server is going to know. And because the server knows if the user modified this information, they can reject requests where they have a weird JWT that doesn't quite match up. Uh, to do this, you need to have a secret key that needs to be kept secret. And we're going to see this uh, in the Catbook React code if we have time at the end. Just know that there's going to be a secret key and it's secret, so keep it secret. Don't put it on GitHub. Yeah. And again, this signature is going to protect our JWT. Um, just a side note, uh, when you're doing these types of authentication, you need to make sure not only for the sake of the user that your session IDs and your tokens are kept um, safe. Because if a hacker is able to get their hands on a user's token or session ID, uh, they can then log in as a user. So make sure that you, and this might be a bit difficult because, um, but you have to be careful about storing your session IDs. Uh, next uh, we're gonna be getting into the password storage, a bit of nitty gritty. So how does password login work? So like the simplest way we could do it is we just have like a user schema in like the database like from the previous workshop. And we can just you know store the password like this. Uh, it turns out this is a horrible, horrible idea because the password is not encrypted and essentially hackers can easily read it. Uh, and there's sort of two main reasons why you don't want to store your password in plain text like this. Uh, the first is, it's a lot easier for hackers to you know, hack into your database than it is to hack into your website, I guess. And if you are storing your passwords like this, if the hackers get their access and their hands on your database even once, suddenly they know every single user's password and they can then pretend to be a user. And that's really, really bad. Uh, the other thing is you don't want the developers of your website to be able to easily access user passwords. Because first of all, they could pretend to be a user, but also users tend to reuse their passwords across websites, even though they shouldn't. And so if you, know, you were doing this, developers could very, very easily uh, look at a user's password and then try to log in on other websites. So you don't want to do this. Uh, the way to properly store passwords is through a process called password pass shopping. Uh, and so on the left, we're going to start off with the user password. Let's say it's Apple. 
And we're going to add a randomly generated salt. It's just going to be a random string. And then we're going to do something called a hashing algorithm on this combined string. And the essence of a hashing algorithm is that it's one way. So given the password and the salt, it's easy to compute the hash. It's easy to go uh, right in this case. But given the hash, password, and salt, it's really hard to figure out the inputs. So you know, even if someone has the hash, password, and salt, it's going to be hard to figure out what the password actually is. And to do this, we need to modify the password store a little bit. So instead of storing the password directly, we're going to store the hash, password, and the salt plus salt. And you're also going to need to store the salt. And this isn't even like, this is just a, the first step in storing passwords securely, but it's like the main step. And once we do this, uh, our password is basically encrypted and hackers will not be able to read it easily. Now, storing passwords is really hard, right? Um, this is just like, again, like I said, the tip of the iceberg. So how does the web lab skeleton store passwords securely? Uh, our solution is we just let Google do this for us because we could make mistakes, but if someone wants to try to hack Google, they can go ahead and try it. And you know, maybe they'll succeed, but let's be honest, they probably will not. Uh, so when you're working on your own websites, um, just Google the details of how to send up set up Google authentication on weblab.is slash gauth. And you can add in Google sign-in for your own websites. Uh, don't look at this right now. You should do this uh, later, uh, but the instructions are there. Side note on what not to do. I was trying to uh, make an account and it turns out that none of these buttons actually worked. So don't do this, do the opposite. Yes. So let's look at how the Google sign-in flow works. Uh, what the user, the client is gonna do is it's gonna make a login request directly to the Google authentication server. It's gonna send the username and the password and it's gonna tell it success or false. Uh, once it happens, we can go to the server, be like, hey, I logged in. And then the server can go and do various API requests. Uh, can anyone, Tell me if there's something suspicious about this example so far. Yeah, yeah exactly. In this example, we're trusting the user. And let me show you how. So what happens when the Google tells us, hey, you had the wrong password? Well, if the hacker has a modified client, they can still just tell the server, hey, I logged in as such and such email. And again, nothing stops us from lying about this. So instead, we're gonna be going back to our sessions and our tokens. And reminder, never trust a user because the front end can be modified by anyone. So here is the actual assignment flow. The start is the same. Um, we're gonna send them a Gmail and password. And instead of telling us true or false, they're gonna give us a success token. And when we go to the backend, instead of telling them, hey, I signed in, we're gonna give them, hey, here's the token I got from Google. Now, what the server is gonna do is, is gonna ask Google, hey, is this token correct? And Google is gonna be like, hey, this token is correct. And then finally the server can handle the API requests and all is well. Now, if we had a hacker, even if they modified the client, Google would not give the client a token because they wouldn't be able to log in. And if you don't have a token, even if you try to send them something, the Google authentication library would be like, hey, this token is a fake, don't trust this user and the hacker would not be able to hack into us um, to the server or as the user. Uh, 
So we do have some time, so we might go a tiny bit over, but I'm gonna try to quickly run through how this looks in practice. Uh, we're gonna be starting off with the client side code. So currently, and maybe at the end of workshop six, this is what the front end looked like, the app, uh, the app component, really, really small. And it was gonna turn into this huge thing. And don't worry, we're gonna work through it pretty quickly. First, we're gonna be starting off with this top half. So the first thing is we're gonna have a user ID piece of state. And this state is gonna really serve two purposes. Uh, the first is you might want to just display the user ID somewhere in the app uh, as displayed to the user, but this is also gonna be used as sort of like a flag to tell the rest of our website whether the user is logged in or not. So at the start, by default, it's gonna be null because the user isn't logged in. Uh, but if we ever do set it to a string, we know that the user is logged in. Next, we have a use effect. So again, this use effect is going to law, uh, trigger the function inside uh, once, as soon as the app loads. And we're gonna make an API request to our new API, uh, who am I? And the reason for this is even though we just loaded the app, the user might actually already be logged in because maybe they like refresh the page or maybe they close the tab. The user might already be logged in, but currently we don't know. So we're gonna ask the server, hey, am I already logged in? Now, if the user is logged in, then in the response, the user dot underscore ID is gonna be set. And then we can go and call set user ID and we can set our user ID to whoever we are logged in as. Uh, the next step is the handle login function. So to go back to our diagram, this is this part in our Google authentication signing. This is the part where the client tells the backend, hey, I logged in as such and such at gmail.com. Uh, can I get some data? So just walking through this, first we're gonna get a user token. So res is gonna be the response we get from when Google sends us a token in response, res is gonna be that data. And within it, the actual token is going to be in res.tokenobj.id token. And finally, we call post and we send the server our token. Once we do that, once we get a response, we can set user ID and we're in, we're logged in. Uh, then we also have a handle logout. Uh, I'm going to skip this. It just sets the user ID to null because we're logging out. Okay. Next up, we have our nav bar. Uh, we've changed the props. So we're gonna, we're gonna be giving the nav bar three props, uh, our handle login and handle logout functions, as well as the user ID. And we can see how the nav bar changes. Um, but first, our nav bar, this is in navbar.js. Uh, we're gonna be importing the Google login and Google logout components from React to Google login. So nice thing about React is we can actually import entire components from our libraries. And here we're importing an entire login and logout button. And finally, we have this const Google client ID. Uh, so when you set up Google authentication for your own websites, you're gonna get a client ID and you can use that. And basically this client ID is a way of telling Google, hey, this is the website someone is trying to log in as. Uh, it doesn't tell Google the user, it tells the Google which website they're trying to log into. And then finally, we have our main uh, login logout code. So again, this is um, this part of the sign-in workflow where the user tries to log in to Google. And just looking at this pretty quickly, uh, we have a ternary statement or an if statement. So depending on whether user ID is set or not, uh, we're going to either display a logout button or a login button. If the user ID is not null, if it has some string value in it, then we're going to display a logout button, right? Because if they if it's set, then they don't need to log in anymore. They just need to log out. And to this logout button, we're going to give it the on logout success is props.handleLogout, which means when 
once the logout you know, runs, once it's done, we're gonna call our handle logout. And on the other side, if props at user ID is null, then we have our login. And once we successfully log in, we call on success props that handle login. And that will trigger the post request to the server and all the stuff that we were talking about before. Uh, we're gonna skip passes in the interest of time. Uh, but as a summary, we have get. Uh, if you want, if you're looking at the slides and you want to learn about the stuff I skipped over, you can come to office hours in the future. But a quick client summary: we have get three new endpoints. We have get API slash who am I, post API slash login, and post API slash logout. Uh, briefly running through some of the server side code. Um, if you look at api.js, we're going to have three new endpoints okay, corresponding to what we just summarized. Uh, on the login and logout endpoints, we're going to call auth.login. Auth.js is a new file with all of our authentication code. And finally, we have router.get who am I. So for who am I, we want to send the user their user ID or their user information. So we're gonna be storing this information in rec.user. So if rec.user is has a value, we're gonna send them rec.user. Otherwise, we're gonna send them empty brackets or basically, basically an, an empty response. Uh, now, some of you might be wondering, hey, rec.user, well, rec is request. So rec.user is part of the request. So doesn't that mean that the uh, user or the client can just change whatever is in rec.user. Uh, and if you're thinking this, your instincts are good, but don't worry. Rec.user, even though it seems like it's part of the request, it's actually set by the server. And we'll see where this happens later on. Uh, okay, moving on to auth.js, all of this stuff. Let's start with the top. So again, we have a client ID and we have this OAuth2 client. Um, just as a side note, I think a lot of times when we refer to client and server, uh, you might think it's exactly the same as front end and back end, but in this code snippet, it's actually not. When we use the word client in this piece of code, we're not referring to the front end. Specifically, in this case, our server is actually the client of the Google authentication server. And so our server is going to be making a request to the Google to check if a token is correct. So we have this weird OAuth2 client thing. Don't worry about it. This is just how you make a request to Google. This is how you use the Google library. And we have our function verify token. This is the main function we're going to use to check if the token a user sends is actually correct. And we use the Google client library to verify the token and do some things. Uh, don't worry too much about it. We just need to know that we have a verify function. Uh, and again, this is sort of the spot in our workflow that we're talking about. Okay, then we have our login function and there's really two key parts of this. So first we're gonna start off with verifying the token that was sent over. And then there's two parts. Uh, first is get or create user. Um, this is gonna be a call to our database we're either gonna check if the user already exists. And if they do, we're gonna get that user's information. If they don't, we're actually gonna create a new user. So get or create user does pretty much exactly what you want it to do. And once that is done, uh, we're gonna go to ref.session.user and we're gonna set it equal to user. Uh, side note, this is a great example of chaining promises because accessing the database takes time. And so does verifying. So this is a great example of why you might want to chain promises because each of these operations takes a bit of time. Now, this final line here might be a bit confusing. What is rec.session.user? Like what, what, what is rec.session? Um, so rec.session is persistent storage, just like cookies. And basically this is what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about um, 
using sessions for persistent authentication, uh, we're doing the exact same thing. And the key is that our record.session.user value is going to remain even if the user reloads. Uh, finally, we have a logout function. Uh, all we do is rec.session.user is equal to null. Um, get or create user. Um, I'm going to skip this one for now, but it does exactly what you expect it to. Um, okay. Next up, we're gonna have a piece of code populate current user. And here is where I told you not to worry about rec.user. That's because in populate current user, we set rec.user to be rec.session.user. Uh, and this is an example of an express middleware. So if you look in the file server.js, we have app.use off.populate current user. And what this means is this is sort of near the top of the file. And so what happens is every single time, every single time you make an API request to your server, auth.populateCurrentUser user is going to run. And it's going to set rec.user to be rec.session.user. And this means the rest of our app can use whatever value is in rec.user and know that it's correct. And then finally, uh, we have this code snippet here, app.use session and this weird thing. Well, what's happening here? So remember, again, we were talking about sessions. Uh, that piece of code is setting all of this up for us. Uh, this is going to create sort of a session store, and it allows us to use the rec.session to store information about each user. Final thing, remember how I said that we might want to use um, secret keys? for signatures, uh, this is where that comes into play. We have a secret, right now it's session secret. If you're writing your own website and you want it to be secure, pick an actually secret value and hopefully your app will be secure. Uh, any final questions? Okay, uh, I think that's all I have for authentication.